tonight. Welcome, welcome. Perfect. We are live. Divine greetings, everybody, beautiful friends and family. Welcome to this very special live stream. I'm so happy to be here with you today as I welcome my amazing friend and fellow warrior, King Tim Neal, who is coming on today. Hi. Yay. Hi, Tim. So with, good to have you. with plant envy. With plant envy. <laughs> <laughs> with the plant envy <laughs> he saw my plant and he is bringing on some flowers that's so adorable i love it we're improvising we are flowing and i'm so happy to be here to share tim's amazing warrior story coming from you know a place of deep depression lack of self-esteem uh poor body you know image issues and coming from that place of darkness, not wanting to live, you were suicidal to this space right here, right now, today, where you are helping people, hundreds and thousands of people um, to break through. You're a breakthrough coach and through your own journey, your own transformation, you have uncovered your purpose. So I am so happy we had you on in our Royal Gathering and the Kings and Queens of Raw community. And it was just so powerful. I got a lot of feedback from a lot of our kings and queens saying how they're you know, grateful for you and sharing your journey. And I thought, let's share this with the world. Let's share your story because truly it's inspiring and can save lives, right? When we hear somebody save their own life and you know, find um, joy and be saved by grace, it's just like, it it helps us so much. You've cer certainly inspired me a lot. You've helped me on my recovery journey so much. I've known you for a few years now, and you've always been so encouraging, so inspiring and um, motivating, right? Seeing you as a light that you are is truly, truly life-changing, and you are changing the world. So thank you so much for being here. I look forward to getting to know you better and to, yes, I want to know a little bit more about you know, we'll take we'll take our audience on a little journey. Maybe you could share a little bit about where you came from, what you were struggling with, and then I'll have a couple sure. of questions in between. So we'll just flow. So welcome, Tim. And thank you. And and just before I start that, I just want to say I kind of knew this would happen at some point. And when I met you, it was love at first sight, and not in a kind of romantic kind of love sense, but in a deep love sense. And I remember our very first conversation. And I picked up on your name because I have a lot of Arabic friends and they all call me Habibi. <laughs> and I can remember like calling you Habibi and we just went dump. And then we had a really deep conversation and then it was just straight in. And you were so supportive and such a beautiful like role model to the juicing thing that I joined and stuff. So I just want to thank you too. You've been a big part of my healing journey as well. So honored to be here and really excited. Well, yeah, I mean, nothing happens by accident. Thank you so much for saying that. I do remember that. I kind of have forgotten how you brought it back. I'm like, oh my God, you did call me Habibi. That was so cute. <laughs> and yeah, deep soul connections. You know, we're here for, for a big mission. We're here to heal ourselves and also to empower each other in different ways. We all have something to share. So, so happy sure, we sure, met. Sure. Yes. Sure. And before I start speaking, I'd just like to frame it as well, because I always think when someone's talking, I'm like, why should I listen to you? Mm. So the reason I want you to listen to me is because I want to be an example of something that's possible that we're told isn't particularly possible. Mm. And I'll explain why that's important in the story of the four minute mile. Now, I'm sure most of us have heard of the Roger Bannister breaking the four minute mile. Yeah. Now, before he broke that record in the 50s, nobody had ever been able to do a four minute mile. And people had tried for hundreds, if not thousands of years, it had been documented throughout history that people were trying to break this. And up until that point, people thought it was absolutely impossible. And some doctors even thought you could damage yourself or I think there was something about people exploding or something if they, <laughs> if they broke the four minute mile. Now, he then broke that after trying and trying and trying. He broke it by about a second, I think it was. Within, I think it was in a month or a few months, someone else had broken it. Within a year, there was about four people broken it. And then within the next five or six years, 20 or 30 people broke it. Now there's over, there's thousands and it's regularly broken by 
um, college students running in athletics at college. And it's just a normal thing now, right? Now, the key there is before he broke it, people thought it wasn't possible. Mm. So they weren't looking for how to do it. They were looking for it to not be possible. And guess what? That's what they got. As soon as he showed it was possible, now people are looking from a different angle. Now they're looking for, oh, it's possible. How do I do it? So that's what I want to display today is possibility, because we are told when we have deep suffering and especially around trauma and the labels that that gets given, like anxiety, depression, panic, bipolar, you name it. The general narrative is you need to learn to just live with it and deal with it. And that's it. I'm here to tell you otherwise. I'm here to show you like Roger Bannister. It is possible to heal. Right. Because, and by the way, if I can do it, I'm no more special than any of you. I've got no particular background that makes me any better at healing than anybody else. I came from a council estate, like community housing, if you're in the States, whatever. Uh, not particularly well off family. Um, no advantages, nothing, didn't know anything about any of this. And uh, managed to heal myself and learn this stuff. So if I can do it, you can do it, it's possible. So let's start from that place, right? So let me tell you my story very briefly. Uh, as a really happy kid, really carefree, come from a big family, big housing estate, loads of friends, loads of people to play with when I was a kid. I was very connected with humans. I used to get the stranger danger chat all the time because I'd talk to anyone. God, if you were a workman and came in my house with some tools and that, you were in trouble. <laughs> you would just go, oh, what's that, mate? What are you doing there? What are you doing? Or like that with everybody. And then I went to school. And um, I can remember coming home from the first day at school, holding my mom's hand. I still remember now. And looked up and I went, why am I here? And she said, to learn. And I went, but I'm not learning anything. They're just telling me to shut up. <laughs> and because I was asking my favourite question, which was why? <laughs> you know it's like do this why you know can I go to the toilet uh, no I stand up to go to the toilet they're like sit down and I'm like why they went because you have to put your hand up and I went why and I went because to go to the toilet and I went are you ever going to say no and they went no I went why then <laughs> and they're like I would just which you can imagine is quite infuriating for teachers and um so I so I ended up not getting on very well um, at school and then I got this teacher when I was seven who made it quite uh, obvious to me that he wasn't going to put up with this so he started picking on me and bullying me a little bit and that kind of gave the kids permission to do it to me and then once he went out the classroom and this kid who was my arch nemesis all the way through school wrote all over his t-shirt I'm sat working he comes back in the classroom and went who did that and he went Tim Neal and I went what so the teacher ran across the table picked me up dragged me outside, smacked me down on the step outside and went, sit there till the next naughty kid comes out. And I was like, F you, dude. <laughs> and I was just like, I lived next door to the school or close, so I just ran home. Now, I want to frame this next bit as well. My mum and dad were lovely, lovely, beautiful souls who hadn't got a selfish bone in their body, did everything to help the community and everybody loved me to bits, but were very scared of authority and school the school kind of system was very different in the 70s. It was very biased towards the teachers having the power. And so inside of that, I went home and remember I've been playing up a lot as well. So I can imagine what it looked like. I went home, told my mom, and my mom went, well, wait till your dad gets home. My dad got home and then they just shouted at me for lying and making stuff up. And why did I, why was I playing up at school and blah, blah, blah. And they sided with the teacher, at which point, I just felt like my entire world had gone against me. I'm seven years old. I, you're very egocentric centric when you're seven. So the world's about you. So I was making it all mean about me. And then my family started asking me why I was lying and started calling me a liar. My, all the people around me were calling me a liar. And I just got branded as a liar. And in the middle of that, I went mute for six weeks and refused to talk to anybody and just went into the darkest place. I've now got, well, what I now know to be PTSD, 
Uh, I got echoing voices in my head while I was asleep, while I was awake. I didn't know the difference between dreaming and awake sometimes because it was so horrific. And I kept getting this one voice that just used to freak me out all the time. Uh, I was depressed. I was angry, very, very angry. And, and I mean, I can't remember a lot of this. My mum told me about it when she was dying. I think she was just trying to remind me of it somehow so I could process it. It was weird why she told me, but anyway, she did. And, um, but then my friend at school was her best friend's daughter. My mum was around her house getting her hair done by her mum. And she was like, oh, I don't know why Tim's still lying. This is six weeks later. And uh, my friend goes, oh, he's not lying. I saw it. Now everybody's sorry, but damage is done. So I'm now in this dark, dark place that makes me violent a lot of the time, makes me so angry, I can't deal with things. I'm screaming, crying. I remember one Christmas, I can't remember what happened, but something happened where I didn't think anyone was listening to me. And it was around my, my, my nan's house, my grandma's house. And we've got a big family. My mum's got 10 brothers and sisters, so it was a big family do. And I remember smacking my head on the floor until I knocked myself out in front of everybody. Uh, I can't even remember what it was about now, but it was frustration and not feeling heard and whatever. And I, that was how I, I couldn't deal with things. So growing up as a kid, I was just angry in trouble, getting in trouble, fighting all the time, became the class clown so I could get attention because I wasn't getting the kind of attention I wanted. I didn't feel, I was disconnected from myself, disconnected from everybody else. Uh, it, it was just horrible. And um, then I got into my teenage and at 16, I, I, I was a bit of a cocky idiot from because I was like so busy shut down to all of this that I ended up overcompensating and being a right cocky little git and I did martial arts as well so I was good at fighting and just it just ended up a shit show really um then at 16 we got chased a group of my mates and I we were rockers and we've got long hair and bullet belts and leather jackets and shit and we got chased by a gang of kids or a gang of blokes in town and they cornered us with knives and stuff. But once they saw how young we were, they were like, oh, they're only kids. But again, just fired my PTSD off. And then I, and then I didn't want to go out anymore. I didn't want to go to the pub. I didn't want to do anything. And um, so that was kind of the place I was in. So then when I did get a bit older, the way I got through all this was to get drunk all the time. And it was an unhealthy level of drunk all of the time to the point. And I'm not very good at drinking anyway. I'm very lightweight. <laughs> so it just ended up a mess. And then a bit later on in my life, it turned to drugs. Now, the thing is, I'm very good on drugs because the drugs actually took all of this away and allowed me to be me. You know, so within a very short time of starting clubbing, um, I ended up being hired as a dancer. Uh, and I thank my amazing mate, Jace, if you're watching this, love you, dude because he ended up asking me if I wanted to work as a podium dancer at my favorite club. So I suddenly got into that world. And then within that world, I was already uh, practicing to be a DJ. I got opportunities to be a DJ and ended up being quite successful at the time as a DJ. And I ended up being a resident of the club. I'd loved more than anything, the Lead Mill in Sheffield, it's world renowned music venue. And I've known it since I was little. All of a sudden I'm a resident there. I work there, I'm hanging around all with, you know, it was amazing. Uh, meeting all the people who were my heroes, if not heroes, but DJs, I loved them. That were suddenly my friends, and and it was I was suddenly elevated to this new position, and I loved it, and it was it was amazing. And all of a sudden, I started seeing what I was capable of, and it started show unleashing my potential, if you like. So that was at a weekend, but <laughs> after the weekend, I would come crashing back down. And then I couldn't speak to five people. Like I had a team of five that I was a, I was a team leader in my software company. And at the end of the day, we had to do a debrief and I had to run it. I couldn't even do that. I couldn't not function with five people that I knew, that I'd spent all day with. The fear of judgment about what they're going to think about what I'm going to say and what if I say something wrong, what if I don't know what I'm doing? I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not really a team leader. Who the hell is a team leader? Blah, blah, blah. was all the narrative in my head they're going to find me out, you know, imposter syndrome. I think we call it a lot nowadays. You know, there was always that in the back of my mind, you know, but then it would get to the weekend and like, 
I'd end up going somewhere like Vancouver. Right? I'd get flown over to Vancouver for a week and treated like a superstar, like an international superstar. They'd take me to restaurants, take me to clubs. I'd play in four or five clubs. They took me on the radio. I'd sign autographs. It was like mental, right? And then, and then they put me on the biggest radio station that's like our Radio One in here with like Annie Mac kind of thing with this guy called Rich who owned the radio station. And like I got in there and I was really good mates with him. He goes, oh, can you play a set for us? And we record it and put it out. So I was like, yeah, yeah, played the set. Awesome. He said, right, we just want to interview you. So I was like, yeah, sweet. So I sat down, put the microphone in front of me and he goes, so Tim, what have you been up to? And I went, and nothing would come out of my mouth. <laughs> Because all of a sudden I'm thinking, I'm not really an international DJ. I'm like, just me. And like, but actually the reality was, I was DJing internationally, so I'm an international DJ. But in my head, I don't see that. I just see I'm being, a, oh my God, I'm not really. And it just melted down, you know, and this used to happen a lot. I remember, uh, I don't know if you're aware of an organization called BNI. It's like a network breakfast networking international um they have it in the states and they've got it in the uk i helped set a chapter up so it's like a breakfast network thing where people come in and share their business and whatever and um i started off with six people there and i became the trainer because i like i liked doing goal setting and stuff like that so i got everyone doing that group slowly built up to 25 and I was happy because I'd met them one by one and it felt safe and everybody introduced me and made me welcome and whatever then we did an open day and I didn't know how this was going to go right so the trainer has to MC it so I suddenly have to MC this event with like a few hundred people at it and I'd spent remember I spent about 18 months building this network and I'd invested my life into it it's all I did for 18 months pretty much I got up there and I went thanks for coming to death <laughs> no noise would come out of my mouth again and I tried three times to just speak and I just went sorry and I just ran off and I I just hid around the corner waiting for everyone to go and I know I just ran down and got in my car and I drove around the corner and pulled up at the side of the road and just burst out crying and just like gutted like the thing that I've spent 18 months setting up I can't go back to now because I'm so embarrassed you know and this is how it used to play out you know, uh, the reason I tell that story is to just like in stark comparison, have you noticed how easy I find this now? <laughs> you know, this this is not a thing anymore. This like I was so excited all morning to speak to you. You it's know, like your throat chakra was so close, you know, from your childhood and you had so many traumatic events. And then like, would you say that at that point during that interview that that was almost like a defining moment in your life that would set you on this new trajectory of opening your throat chakra. It's almost like, you know, we have these moments in our life where we're kind of like forced to heal, you know, we're forced to look at ourselves. And even though we could function for a certain time under certain, uh, you know, under certain conditions or even under influences of alcohol and drugs, but then there's like a, a certain point where we're just like, forced to look at ourselves and be like okay what's going on would you say that that moment you breaking down and crying what did you feel at that moment what was going on in you like did you know what was happening yeah I was um I was about nine years into self-development then mm -hmm. and I'd done a lot of work on it I'd been to speaking workshops I'd I'd had a job where I went around the country and trained people for two years <laughs> You know, and I had to stand up in front of classes between 10 and 30 people twice a week for two years. I went all over the UK doing that with strangers every single time. I didn't know anybody. I, had to, I was like a one man band with a projector and everything. I had to set it all up and just you'd have thought you'd have got over it. right? You'd have thought you'd have got over it. I, I did Toastmasters for a little bit. I, I did all kinds of stuff. And, and I tell you, like. From the first time I did that classroom to the last time the fear didn't get any less so that repetition of doing it over and over and over didn't make any difference because like you said my throat chakra was so closed down and 
And I was kind of bumbling unconsciously through self-development, trying to figure out what it was, doing what most of us do, which is starting in the wrong place, you know, trying to work out why what's wrong going on in your head. And we're, you know, it, my head was a shed. It was just a mess, you know, and some days it'd be okay. So some days I could get up and speak and I'd be fine. Other days, nothing, no noise would come out. And there was various bits in between that too, you know. It was never one or the other. It was somewhere along that spectrum, you know, and it's, it was, it was crippling. And, but no, I wouldn't say I was a defining moment. I think, um, I think my very first defining moment was when my girlfriend said to me, you're not very happy, are you? And I went, yeah, I'm fine. She went, no, you're not. She went, it is not normal to be as unhappy as you are. But you thought you were happy, like. Well, I didn't. I didn't know. Mm. I didn't. I'm me. It's like it's like asking a fish what's water like. What is water like? I think it's really interesting that you say that because a lot of people have this conception of this idea of like being depressed. I just want to put that in because you know you have to be depressed. Mm. You have to be in bed all day. Or, but really, the reality is, and I can relate to what you're saying because we could just be like. We didn't, we don't know. We don't necessarily always mm. know that we're unhappy. Mm. I love that you're saying that. It's really interesting because we could be smiling. We could be, and that's why like, even in our surroundings, people could just look okay. But then somebody who's like living with you, mm. a girlfriend or a boyfriend, they'll know the true you. They'll know mm -hmm. uh, that you're not really happy before sometimes you even know it. So it's just to be, it's interesting to like, look at those signs within ourselves and say, okay, am I happy? And to ask ourselves those questions on a day to day, like what, Am I happy? Am I satisfied with my life? Am I putting on a real smile or am I? And we could feel that, right? It's like you could tell when somebody's putting yeah, on a yeah. smile just to please. So I love that you say that. Okay, so how how did you get happy? Like what what is happiness to you and how did you come from that place of not being so happy to like did you take it? Were you like you weren't aware uh were you upset when you heard that? <laughs> no, but interestingly, um I went, no, 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 I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. And she went, read this. And she'd got a leaflet on depression from the doctor. Mm. And by the end of, I got to the bottom of the pamphlet, I was sobbing. Mm. But I wasn't sobbing in sadness. I was sobbing in recognition, like, oh, my God, that explains it. Because <laughs> mm. I didn't even know. Sometimes you don't know, dear. You? you don't even know until somebody puts it in your face. And then you like, oh. You know, and it was like, that's why I say it was a defining moment. So then it was like, right, okay. So she took me to the doctors. And the funny thing is, she cried. The whole time we were at a doctor, she cried because she was really upset. And of course, I'm master of no emotions because I've been through so much trauma. I've just learned to switch it off. So I don't feel, I just don't feel, right? So I'm sat there in the doctors going, yeah, I'm all right, mate. <laughs> just like... She's crying and he goes, I think you're the one with depression to her. And like, she's like, no, I'm fine. She was the happiest soul you'd ever meet. She was just upset for me. She was scared. You know what I mean? And it was like, anyway, I then agreed to go on antidepressants, which lasted a week because I just didn't want to feel that numb and horrible. And, and in fact, one of my friends uh, said, I also seemed way too happy at times because it was Zoloft and they used to wire me. It was like a... <laughs> Yeah. Oh, God, it was like we were doing pills. So I was like, going around to see everybody. Do you want to come out tonight? And everyone's like, are you all right? <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm fine, 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 thanks. <laughs> right. And um, so anyway, I ended up stopping that. I went to see counsellors, therapists, which I just ended up falling out with all the time because I just thought they were talking nonsense half the time. And then, um, then I found this guy called Roy, or she found this guy called Roy, who was amazing. And he actually was the first person who handed me, me the keys back and said, dude, you're doing this. I went, what do you mean I'm doing this? And he went, you're doing all of this. He said, you don't know you're doing it, and it's all unconscious, but you're doing it. And he goes, and I know you don't like me saying that. And I went, not really. And he went, right, but listen to this. If you're doing it, you can stop doing it. And that was the first time anyone had ever given me my power back in any form whatsoever. And I didn't get it. It took me a long time to understand what the hell he was talking about. But after a year of seeing him, I kind of was got a few strategies for coping with things. Then came across Tony Robbins from a friend. 
ended up doing a lot of his work, did his seminars, ended up working out the back of his seminars, found all that community of the people going through all that together on that journey and kind of found my people. And that was a defining moment because that was when I discovered I want to do this for people. And as I shared with you the other day, you know, I sat at the back of the seminar thinking that in confusion because I couldn't even look anybody in the eye, let alone do a session with somebody or help them, you know, and but ironically, it was like it was like it was sent as a sign to get me hooked into a bigger reason for doing self-development, that it's not just about me. Share with us you what know. you wrote at that seminar, please, because that was really powerful. You were saying that it was like you don't even you don't even know like what took over you, but it was almost like your higher self was writing that. Yeah. So uh, on the last day, they uh, they Joseph, his head coach, does a few different things with you and, and he does mainly food stuff and speaks about uh, veganism, actually, and stuff like that. And then at the end, he goes, right, we're just going to play a little word game before we all go. And uh, he goes, I'm going to put these lists of words up on the boards. And I just want you to pick a couple of words from this one, a sentence from that one, this from there, that there, and just make it into a paragraph. And that's all he said. Right? So I just took these just things that jumped out of me and wrote them down and then switched them around and whatever. And then he goes, right. And then, by the way, that is who you are. And I looked at it and I was just like, Phew. and then he started passing the mic around and people were, most people's were really kind of about having stuff and getting stuff, manifesting stuff. Like I'm going to manifest my dream house and my car. And people, were, it seemed to be a lot of that conversation. So then the lady would help me go through the seminar uh, one of the helpers Sandra came over and she goes can I look at yours so I showed her it and she just burst out crying she grabbed my hand dragged me up to the front of the stage <laughs> passed it up to Joseph and he looked at it and he went and I see him tear up a little bit and he just put his hand out and went come up here brother and there's about I don't know a few thousand five thousand people maybe left there was ten thousand at the main thing but about half are left so I'm up on stage and I just look out at this like, and I was like, oh. <laughs> just instant fear. And then he was like, he put it in my hand. He goes, read it, brother, and give me the, and held the mic. And I don't know what, but the energy came from somewhere to open my throat. And uh, what I'd written is, I'm an outstanding, pure, playful team player, a guide and maker of dreams who enables the others to get the most out of themselves. I laugh so those around me may laugh. And I shine so those around me may shine and unleash the power of their human spirit. And it's uh, now that might be the kind of thing I would say. But back then, that was uh, I read it going home on the train and I'm like, that sounds so weird. And the bit about human spirit, I was like, oh, my God, did I say spirit? Oh, ooh. <laughs> you know, whereas now obviously but back then that just felt an alien thing to say and I had a bad time with religion growing up so I then was fighting against that I said the word spirit does that mean oh my god what the hell you know I was going through all that kind of malarkey on the way home but now when I read that that's who I am <laughs> that's what I do that is I what always, I do and I am sorry yeah no I was gonna say I always see it almost as you know, there's like a disconnect sometimes from the higher self that we all have and then our ego mm. self that's been so traumatized and beat down. And then there's, you know, there's moments in, like in your life where you had this this channeling from your higher self, from God, from spirit, but like your ego was just like, or like a, maybe not the ego, mm -hmm. or like, you know, the, the, the hurt you was just couldn't even comprehend what was to come, but it was like really, it's really beautiful to see that. And now you're connected is what I want to say is that you've, mm. you've, heard those parts of yourself you've healed those parts of yourself you've loved those parts of yourself so that they can come in communion you know with your highest self and now you're this integrated whole you know person a man who's really been like through a lot in order to step into your power it was almost like a foreshadowing of your true true like big gifts of service it's really beautiful that you were able to tap into that. And I think we all can tap into that. We all can tap into our highest potential. But do we? Do we give ourselves a chance? Or do we kind of stay in the playing small, the fears? 
Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's a there's a huge amount of things that we come across growing up that hold us in that lowly place, I believe. And I, I do a lot of work around conditioning with people. Um, and I know you're starting to work through your human design and stuff like that, which is a magnificent deconditioning tool as well. And so is the feeling code. You know, and those two things combined and like what you're speaking about there just to me sound now when I'm studying this sounds like design versus personality. Mm. So design being who you really are, personality being your conditioned learned self. And like that conditioned learned self had had a bad time in me, <laughs> you know, and not I'm not saying that from any victim place or wanting sympathy. I'm just saying it had a rough time and I didn't realize how rough until I wrote my story out for a Tony Robbins marketing course I was doing. And I was like, wow, I didn't realize what I'd actually been through, you know, and because you don't, you just deal with it in the moment, don't you? But actually when I look back at it, I was like, I did well to get through that, let alone get through it in the manner I've got through it, you know, but now I look back at it and it, it's my training. Yeah. My belief is that we come here on some form of mission that we've decided on somewhere else. I don't know what those places are, but I have a feeling I decided to come here on a, a very important healing mission. In order to do that, I've got to train hard. Like if you look at somebody, you look at somebody who's in the Olympics, they don't just do a bit of jogging in the morning and lift a few weights in the gym, pretend to while they're listening to music and playing on social media. Do they? they they train their ass off and then they become world class and they can like take on the best in the world and can be the best version of them. I feel like I've been that spiritually and it's taken a hell of a lot of work, a hell of a lot of work to get where I am. But I don't look at any of it negatively. I look at it like I was blessed to go through that because my favorite thing in the whole world is watching somebody come alive in front of me who's been stuck and hurt and wounded and whatever to watch them come alive in front of you and just there's nothing better that is my favorite thing in the entire world and I'm so blessed to have the tools and gifts to be able to help people through that mm. I wouldn't swap that for anything there's some of the moments I've had have just been breathtaking you know, so I wouldn't swap that for anything, but I wouldn't have that if I hadn't been through the other. So I, so I embrace the whole thing. It's exactly. all part of the perfection of yeah. how I got here to be chatting about this with you today. Exactly. You know, yeah. So, so, but the biggest, biggest defining moment, if you want a defining moment, was when I met Tom and he taught me how to process emotion. Because up until then, I'd had 30 years of self development. Right. And I trained in NLP. I'm an NLP master practitioner. I did hypnotherapy, timeline therapy. I did the full landmark forum series and ended up on their instant in the uh, leadership program. I did Tony Robbins, all the stuff you could do, ended up on the working out. About, I just did everything I could and nothing was really working. I was a bit better. I was a bit better. But remember the BNI thing I told you about that happened after all of that. So it. So I was still very wounded and still not able to be vulnerable, not able to open myself up at all. And then my sister-in-law, um, we were coming back from London, went to my brother's, he lived outside London, and my sister-in-law went, oh my God, you've got to meet this man. I went, all right. She's a, at the time, she was a director of a big media agency who got uh, have a lot of coaches coming in. And she had got this guy to come in and coach people. And she went, I've never seen anything like what's happening to people. She went, our team went to Switzerland on his course. Uh, I think it's Switzerland or somewhere. On his course. And they've come back like different people. She went, watch these videos. So I watched this video. And there was one particular one of my friend Rita. And she, she was explaining her experience and the freedom in it give her and how much it had changed. And I could see it in her. I saw the before and after. And I was like, whoa, what's happened to her? And I was like, that's enough. I want to go there. So long story short, I end up there. Find out that it's going to be about going inside and feeling. 
So I go and sit at the back so I can get out without him noticing me leaving because I think this is hokum. This won't work. Nothing like this ever works on me. And then he said, right, what I want you to do is think about uh, think about something traumatic, something that, you know, triggers you emotionally. So I was like, OK, I'll think about getting attacked by those guys because that comes around nearly every day. So still at 40 years old, I still used to think about that daily. If some, if, if I was around people shouting about having fun, anything that sounded a bit unsafe, like them running after us shouting, just used to trigger me. Like we were on holiday in Zanti. Me and Chrissy were on holiday in Zanti years ago, uh, about 11 years ago. We got to the resort a day before everybody else. So we had it to ourselves for a day. And then we went for a sleep in the afternoon so we could go out late at night and um, woke up to 30 kids who had shown up. And they were all outside in the pool, just shouting about and batting the ball to each other. I woke up, freaked out, like panic attack. I was having a full on panic attack. I couldn't breathe. Couldn't, and all I wanted to do was get out of that room. But to get out of the room, there's only one way out and it's via the pool. So I couldn't get out of the room. I'd like pull the curtains down. Chris is like, are you all right? What's going on? I didn't even know what's going on. <laughs> I, I couldn't explain to her what was going on. I had no idea. My vision had gone like tunnel vision. I couldn't breathe. I was like, and, I, and I'd only just started seeing her. We'd only been together a few months. So she's like, I'm like trying to hide it and trying to, because I don't even really know what's going on. And then, it ends up taking me a couple of hours to calm down. And then it took me about another half a day to manage to get out room to actually see that there were just a load of kids having fun. And I ended up quite friendly with them all after the week, but it that shook me. That really shook me. So I knew that stuff was still inside me. You know, so anyway, Tom's like, right, I just want you to sit down and think about that thing. So I think about that thing, right? And I'll give you a guess right now, because I don't think I've told you this. I'll give you a guess. Where did the energy show up? Good guess. In the throat. <laughs> <laughs> like someone had got two hands around my throat, strangling me. Like, you know what it's like when you go in and get one of them really strong energies, it's surprisingly physical. And it was literally like someone was trying to crush my windpipe. I like, and he goes, and then all I want you to do, and then he took us through the technique that I'll take you through. And it got to the other end of it. And I'm like, like I can breathe and he said right now I want you to think about that thing again and see what's there and I'm like I remember my eyes coming open and I was like it's not there now you got to remember I've carried that round for 26 years 24 years at that point and every time I think of that thing it's there and I think of that thing and it's not there that was life-changing that was pivotal I'm like, I found it. I found what I've been looking for. And then by the end of that weekend, I was like, so different. You know, like now the tube, the underground looked like a, a, an opportunity to meet loads of people, <laughs> not a complete freak out because there's too many people and I can't process it. You know, and because it's incredibly unsafe in my world because I can't take in all the possibilities of what might happen and process it so I'd used to avoid crowded places I walked down into the tube and go whoa beautiful people everywhere look at this I'm going to go and talk to someone and freak them out because people don't like talking in London so so I was like right I'm going to go and talk to somebody and like got on the train and I was just like hi man how are you doing what have you been doing like just I'm like a kid again and that I was like that picture you put up earlier that was me six months before it all went wrong and I kind of felt back to that, you know, and it wasn't perfect. I had to do a lot more of it afterwards, but it took away the big four or five things. Like I'd lost my mum and dad uh, seven years previous to that within three months of each other after them both being ill for a long time and me looking after them. And I buried that because I'm so good at just burying things and not feeling it. I didn't realise how much that had wrecked my health until that day. And I released that. I released the grief of them. And like, so I came away like in a different place. That was pivotal completely. You know, and then I said to him at the end, I went, dude, teach me how to do this. 
I've been looking, you know, when I did NLP, I came off the back end of it and I was rubbish as a coach because I still have my own trauma. When I did hypnosis, I was rubbish. The first person who laughed at my hypnosis voice put me off, didn't want to do it anymore. You know, it's just every, everything, nothing worked. And I got off the back end of this and I was like, I can do this. And he was like, I know. And, and that changed everything. And that was like nine years ago. Wow. That's so amazing. And like, as you say, I see it as a shift in perspective that totally. can be achieved from alchemy, right? It's like the transformation mm. of that emotion. And when you were speaking mm -hmm. of, you know, going from having the anxiety of having a lot of people around to actually being an excitement of it, right? In the same in the mm. same scenario, you could see things in a different way. And it's just about learning to go to the root of that emotion. And it's something that I'm learning with you and also with Queen Tracy, who's been teaching me. And like you said, like I've been doing so much self-development too. And until I could really fully learn to sit with the emotion, I wasn't mm. going anywhere too, exactly like what you're saying. And I know a lot of uh, our friends and family that are watching today can relate to that. Um, you know, and we, we, we learn that too in recovery. Oh, just learn to sit with the emotion and ride the wave. But sometimes we need help to do that. Sometimes it's too much. The trauma, the, the charge, the emotional charge that's associated with that trauma is so strong that it could be really scary to be with it. But you know, when we have a coach like yourself to help us through it, to help us to um, process it and learn, then eventually learn to do it on our own, then mm. it's such a game changer because honestly, sometimes when we have those anxiety attacks, those panic attacks, those cravings, whether it be for food, drugs, alcohol, we literally feel like we're going to die, right? We literally feel like yeah, it's yeah, too yeah. much and we need to run away, either fight or flight, either uh, numb yeah. it, either uh, scream it. We all have our own way of coping with it. But what if we don't yeah. use those mechanisms? What if we actually learn to go deep within then we, we transform, like we say, and then we could turn something that was very an anxious situation into like an opportunity for exploration. And it's so funny because Queen Tracy has been telling me that she's like, oh, whenever I get a trigger now, I'm like, oh, look, a trigger. Let me go into <laughs> that. Let me dive into that. Tracy, who's also uh, working with you as well and building a community. Yeah, yeah. So we'll be, we'll talk about that a little bit more after, but I love your, uh, I love your collaboration and all the work that you do together because that is the key to overcoming our addictions, to you know, healing our traumas, even saving our relationships. Because there could be something like you know, um, uh, an emotion of jealousy, for example, that comes up, and that could be, you know, a reaction could be to accuse, to attack, to you know, yeah. uh, scream out our emotions. But really, it's it's a trauma that that we can process on our own and then come to our partner, for example, and say, Hey, I was feeling this way or, you know, but I've processed it. It's not coming from this place of anger or, you know, initial reaction. We can process it on our own and then come to the person in a different light. It's not to say that we're repressing it. It's not to say we don't want to express it, but we have to go on that journey on our own. And it could literally save yeah, a yeah. marriage. It could save a, a friendship, save all kinds of stuff when we know how to deal with that emotion and if i'm making myself clear but it's just it's just, the most absolutely. important thing we can learn in life is to process our emotion and to go to the root absolutely. of it, go to the intensity of it and then it, it, it yeah, alchemizes yeah. it changes something happens it becomes more light but we have to go yeah, to the yeah. intensity of it yeah and specifically as we speak about the we, we say that our technique's sensational <laughs> because it is sensational, but it's also sensational. It's about senses, right? It's not always the feeling. And I think that's why that advice of just lean into the feeling doesn't often make any difference for people because it's, or it might make a bit, but it doesn't really resolve because there's a key distinction between feeling and sensation. So they are interchangeable, but just to be very clear, Okay. We tend to go thought, feeling, sensation. So the thought triggers it. Then you get the wave of the feeling. So I look at the feeling more as the emotion, you would call it. So say it's um, anxiety. But then you have the sensation of anxiety, which is the 
the physical feeling in your body and the location of that feeling. That's where to go and work, not not to feel the anxiety because that will just send you in circles. You know, it's like, and your body, as you're quite rightly describing there, your body's designed to get you out of there, fight or flight. It's designed to get you away from anything that's painful, you know, and that's useful in the physical world, really useful. You know, like when you're growing up, you soon learn that if you put your hand on the cooker or put it in the fire or trap it in the door or fall off your bike, not good. <laughs> you know, those things hurt. You soon learn to not do them. But if you think about it, you actually then limit your world a bit, especially if you fell off your bike and then you don't want to go on your bike anymore. Now you limit your life to I don't go on bikes. Mm -hmm. You know, and but that can be useful largely in a physical sense. In an emotional sense, it's not useful at all because the opposite is true. <laughs> we need completion with things. Mm -hmm. If we don't complete the feeling level energy of it, mm -hmm. which when we have a trauma, that's what's happened. The, the energy is more than we can deal with. So we take it inside and it's incomplete. So if that feeling level experience is incomplete, we store it along with everything that went with it at the time. So then when something comes along that resonates with that and vibrates it and gives it a wobble and reminds us of it, then we feel the same as we did in the moment because we've stored it all. But the trouble is that's in our unconscious mind that doesn't know the difference, doesn't understand time and space. So it doesn't know that that was 20 years ago. It feels exactly the same. And this is, this is to your point, this is exactly why it is the most important thing to do is to process that. Because when you're clean of that stuff, you get a true reading from your inner compass. Now, as you'll know from working with Tracy, it's like we all have a slightly different thing we listen to for the compass. Like, where, where's your definition? What's your authority? Do you know? My heart, like in that sense? No, no, no you're, a, you're a human design authority. Do you know what it is? Um, four, six. She said, I don't know, is right. that the numbers? I'm just getting to know it. So yeah, I'm- Oh no, yours, your, yours, your authority. Authority is how you make decisions. So you're oh. the same as me, which is solar plexus, which means we can trust our feelings. Yeah. So we know that if we've processed everything, our feelings are accurate. So if you go walk into somewhere and meet someone new and you get a bit of a, mm, not sure about them, you're right. Mm. You know, because that's your way of checking in with your authority. But you can't do that if you've got trauma, if you've got stuff that's stopping you going deeply inside. You can't rely on that. It clouds our judgment. Um, it clouds yeah, our yeah. judgment. And I love this too, what you're saying, because I think a lot of people aren't even aware. Like I wasn't even aware of where I was feeling the sensation. And thank you for making that clarification because it's true. She does talk about sensation, not feeling. It's like always go to the sensation. And it's mm. still like, I'm still very programmed. I'm still like coming out of my own sure, programming. Sure. And I didn't even know. It took me a long time. She was like, where are you feeling? And sometimes it was more obvious than others. I'd be like, okay, I feel it in my heart. I feel it in my throat. Um, but other times it's very subtle and it's like, mm. can we remember, you know, can we connect to our body in that sense? Because there is a sensation and she's really helping me to, to go to that sensation because I wasn't aware of it. And then it's like, oh my God, it does feel like you said, you know, like hands on my throat. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's really amazing. And then the, the, the sense of completion too, like going to it, reliving it and then releasing it it's like she says fear is fe feel everything and release F -E -A yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 or feel feel everything and rise as well rise yeah so great yeah it's beautiful and it's like so simple yeah so powerful you know and in the first 30 first three months i let go of just about everything that had held me back you know it was just because I'm, I'm all in on self-development, it always have been. So when I got a tool that actually worked and gave me that level of uh, utility in my life after using it, like all of a sudden I could do all these things I could never do before. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like I used to really struggle with the sound of my voice. So I couldn't, I couldn't record things like audios and things. If I did, I certainly couldn't edit it because <laughs> that would mean listening back to it. And I just, I just wouldn't put it out there. 
I would not put it out there. I'd just sit going, oh my God, is that what I sound like? And then I'd say to someone, oh God, you heard how bad I sound on this. And they go, well, that's what you all sound like. I'm no. <laughs> you know? And uh, video, oh my God, on video, I'd be like, um, 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 um. Um, 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 <laughs> just that. so I'd be like oh my god I can't watch that you know and then I came back off this and especially on the workshop where I met Tracy which was a presentation workshop where we processed all this stuff out about talking and showing up on video and whatever I could suddenly just make video not have to rehearse them not have to make it 15 times and edit it the best bits out and put it all together it used to take me a crazy amount of time I could go on lives, I could do this kind of thing without any concern whatsoever because all I'm going to do is speak my truth. And if people don't like that, then I can't control that. But I'm only going to tell my truth. So I've got nothing to worry about. It's you like know, you, nobody can. It, yeah, sorry. Sorry to interrupt, but I'm, I'm feeling like it was like your need for living at your purpose was stronger than all your fears. It was like so strong in you, you know, to like you yeah. had to, you just had to overcome them somehow. Sorry, go ahead. I did. Yeah. No, I did. I did. And especially the speaking thing. And I don't know why I, from a kid. Like I put even in the middle of that trauma, I did school plays and things. I did drama and I did plays and I always put myself in a position where I had to speak. There's something in me new. Right. And I did um, I did a plant med medicine retreat in Colombia in the jungle and the the shaman at the end of it and I went there with the coaching company that I worked that I was a coach for on retreats and stuff and we took people there on a retreat but I did it as well and um so the shaman was told we were all coaches and at the end on the the last ceremony Jesus I got out of the back end of that and I felt like I'd done 10 rounds with Mike Tyson I was just laid laid up the floor of like drool coming out of my mouth just dribbling like and it, it had been hell. And it was letting go of the hatred of my mum and dad. because, And I didn't even know that was there. I was just so angry at them for not sticking up for me. You know, but I'd buried that deep, really deep. And I didn't even know it was there. And that had all come out and I'd cleared all of that. I was just laid there up the wall kind of. And the shaman's daughter, because the shaman can only speak Spanish. So her daughter was translating to her daughter. And Maria came up to me and she's like, uh, Tim, mum wants to talk to you. Are you finished? And I went, literally. <laughs> so um, I went outside and she's like, mum said, you're not a coach. And I said, okay. She said, you're a healer. Mm. And I went, yeah. And she said, you need to use your voice, but you don't. You're a speaker. You're here to speak. And I was like, and I haven't told anything to anybody. Like, and I was like, wow and then she went she wants to do you a little ceremony so she actually blew ayahuasca into my eyes <laughs> like a spray kind of thing and then took me on this journey and it, it was about me she was telling me about seeing me speaking in these big places and speaking to people and online and and she said you're going to do a lot of work with america and that's funny because that's shown up since then mainly um and it was just like confirmed everything i was thinking about why i got this obsession with sorting my speech out you know and it's uh i guess we all have that knowing inside of us of things but we just can't verbalize it or we can't figure it out consciously but there's something inside us that draws us towards certain things or and i have always had this fascination with speaking even though I was scared of it, I put myself through so much pain of workshops and stuff, you know, that at the time people around me have been like, why are you doing this to yourself? <laughs> I was like, I don't know. I just have to, you know, it's, but now it's clear. Now it's clear. Yes. And I think like, what would you say to others that are watching? Sorry, my dog is barking. Um, <laughs> I'm seeing it as, like your deepest pain is also your place of service, right? This is what I've, you know, been, been talking about as well. Like if somebody is struggling with whatever it may be, you know, diabetes or addictions mm. or, you know, uh, 
fears, like if you could only go into those places and work on yourself so that you can overcome them, whatever it is that you're struggling with, like that's that's what God wants you to serve from. That's where you're going to connect with people the most from like now from your, you know, experience from, you know, having trouble speaking. Now you're inspiring others to speak, you know, like everybody who's watching you says, wow, if he could do this, then so can I. And that is one of the greatest thing that you have to share is hope, hope for recovery. Mm -hmm. And um, what advice would you give to somebody who is struggling with something like that? Like if they're really blocked with, you know, fear of whatever it may be, public speaking, or even recovering, even getting healthy, juicing, doing all this stuff, like, what advice would you tell them to maybe even start on their journey of maybe they know the idea of serving is too big. But also for me, like that was what helped me to get better too. like to know that someday my journey was going to help others that kept me going. Like I had to think of others. I had to think of just like you, like you knew your purpose was bigger than yourself. Um, mm. I'm not really sure where I'm going with this, but like, what would you say to, to, to others to encourage them on, on their path right now, if they are struggling? You've just taken it. They've just taken the words that I was going to say out of my mouth. Make it bigger than you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Make it bigger than you. We, we can get self-obsessed. Mm -hmm especially if we've had a bad time and we're trying to figure it out and we're trying to fix ourselves or whatever, you know, it's like, not that there's anything broken, but that's how it appears to us. So it's like, we can get caught up in that. And I don't think it's narcissism. I think it's quite natural to want to figure yourself out and, you know, uh, work that out. But it's like, I believe the biggest pandemic in the world is lack of self-love. I think that's the root of all human problems. Yet, yeah, we're told we're selfish. You know, and the whole, that whole narrative, which I'm going to speak with you next time on your, on your channel, is like, that whole narrative is just so damaging to humans. You know, I look at spirituality as meaning connection. So that connection to yourself connection to the others and connection to whatever your higher power is and i believe that is the spiritual journey is that connection no it starts with you though you know it's like i don't know if i said this to you or someone else but like the only spiritual message i ever hear come out of society is when you get on the airplane and they give you the talk about masks <laughs> put your own mask on first why because you're no good to anyone dead. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of us are walking around emotionally dead because we've got no connection to ourselves, And it's the most important thing. And I believe that you're sent these struggles to just, like, like for instance, if, you, if you're walking along the road and your knee starts hurting, the way we look at, way we look at self-development is that there's something wrong because we hurt, right? There's something, right? If you, your knee, your nervous system designs so, in such a way that if your knee hurts, it'll send a message to your brain going, this hurts, take a look at it. There's nothing wrong. It's just an alert system. And it's the same inside of us. So if you've got something showing up like anxiety, depression, whatever label that's been given, by the way, I de-label everything. We talk about two things. We talk about overwhelm and resistance. And we talk about it in those terms because those words are clean. There's no baggage with them. Because the baggage often causes as much problem as the actual feelings you've got. But actually, you've got some level of overwhelm. And that causes resistance to taking action. So let's look at it through that angle. So if you've got something showing up that isn't some level of overwhelm that's making you feel not how you want to feel how about if you just change the perspective on that and just say right thank you thank you satellite navigation gps system inside of me you're telling me i'm not showing up as me in some way this is how we start so go and address that thing but if you treat it like in sessions with people me and tracy both make it so much fun 
we just try and laugh about it and we do it from compassion obviously and if it's serious we'll be serious but the vast majority of time we'll try and make it fun Mm -hmm. and we'll try and show it from a different perspective both of us as well as doing emotional work we're both very good at changing perspective because when you look at it from a different angle like i love that wayne dyer saying when you change the way you look at things the things you look at change yes because it does the perspective is everything it's like when you get those I can't remember what they're called. Is it anamorphic art, street art, where they do those things where people look like someone's falling down a hole or whatever. And then you go around the other side and it just looks like a jumbly mess. You know, the perspective is everything. So the perspective of whatever you're going through is everything. If you think it's a bad thing and you get inside of being a victim about it, which we're trained to do, we are trained by society. Victim is a very, like Caroline Myers calls it, woundology. And people literally trade their wounds for energy off each other. Mm-hmm. And you you know it. If you put a post up on Facebook about your suffering, you get a million people coming, oh, you're okay. You put, you're succeeding at something. You might get a little bit of feedback, but if you keep putting things up about your succeeding, you'll end up nobody commenting on it because people don't reward you for that but they reward you for suffering so we end up not um, this is unconscious right and i'm not judging anybody because i was in fact my gene keys are all about healing that wound of um victimhood that's my that's my um radiance key is that is healing that victimhood right so i know it well i used it for a long time and inside of that energy, you will never shift it because you're getting payback for it. Mm. So you're getting paid back for the, for the problems you've got. You're getting paid back for the suffering that you share with people. So it's so important to, on a perspective point of view to understand that. And if you can shift it to actually, thank you for this gift of the horror that I'm living at the moment. This now means that I get to shift that and I get to change something with me that means this isn't gets transformed in from hell to heaven you know my life was hell on earth but now i believe in belinda carlisle (laughs) heaven is a place on earth yeah and just as cheesy as i am but it's like but but it is and heaven is heaven and hell exist on earth Mm -hmm. yep i definitely don't think we have to wait to die to see what that feels like it's it's right here within us and, I and I've gone that. from one, I've gone yeah. from one to the other. And mm-hmm. but I don't think I'd appreciate heaven exactly. like I do. Yeah. If so you hadn't gone through uh, hell, <laughs> you had to go through hell to appreciate it. And that's why people in recovery, people who like really overcome their their addiction, especially, we say, you know, in the meetings, like we have the potential to be the happiest people on the planet, you know, people who overcome, who've been through that hell, who like get to the other side, we're actually going to be much happier than those who haven't been through that hell because we're so grateful to be alive. I'm so grateful for my life. Like I, you know, have surrendered to God, to like being of service, whatever that may look like, whether it's alive Mm -hmm. like this, whether I, you know, serving my daughter, helping somebody else, like my life has become about serving and I find so much joy in that now. Um, But yeah, like we have to give thanks. And I love what you say about shifting the perspective. And I know we've said this before, but it's like going from, oh, this is happening to me to like, this is happening for me, whatever that may be, whether it's a breakup, whether it's a death, whether it's a a, a state of dis-ease, like whatever it is, start shifting your perspective and you're going to see the blessings in it. You're going to see the lessons that are there for you. And for me, that's changed everything from like, like you said, you know, oh, why, why am I here? Why am I in rehab? Why am I doing this? Like, oh my Mm -hmm. gosh, but I knew deep inside that it was a perp, there was a purpose to it. And I think we all have that purpose. We all have a purpose, whether that's whatever that the, the way you express it will be unique to you. It might not be public yeah. speaking. Maybe it's music, maybe yeah, yeah. it's artwork, maybe it's uh, you know, writing a book, like whatever it is, we all have a gift. And I feel like, you know, too many people go uh to the grave with their unfulfilled dreams. Like too many people stay in that story of playing small uh 
but it's like taking those steps you know you've been taking those steps every day for years and like following mm -hmm. the you know that breadcrumb trail to, like you didn't know fully what, what it was going to look like and you still maybe no. don't know you know you still like you know that ted talks <laughs> maybe in in your near future or that book maybe like you don't know the full like, the full scope of what you will accomplish but you're taking the next step you know like coming on and speaking with me and you know starting your community I'd love to hear some more about that as well so you you are in full service and I feel like the opportunities the scenarios will present themselves more and more once we are aligned like it cannot be any other way so I'm so excited yeah, yeah. for your future and to see all the different ways that you will be serving more people and helping some more people um, with your incredible gifts and your journey because it's, it's really it's really something to see you be where you are today after everything that you've been through and and rise above that's what you're doing every day so tell us a little bit about your community that you and tracy are, are creating and how that will serve us cool and what what's interesting that you said there is that our rise our yeah. rise <clears throat> can you remember um i said one of the pivotal points was my mate getting me the job dancing yes right guess what the night was called <laughs> Rise. <laughs> rise. What? So rise, is, rise mm. has been in my life for so long. And then get this. We started working with the business coach because our company is called Rise and Shine. So, um, and the community is, uh, ooh, headphones nearly run out. And the community is called um, Rising Stars. Wow. And so, but we did used to be called Express Yourself. And we're working with a business coach and he said, I'm not feeling this name, guys. I'm really not feeling it. He said, I get it, but I don't know. It's not. He said, can I have a go? And I went, yeah, yeah. This guy knows nothing about me, right? Nothing. And he goes away, comes back two nights later and he just uh, sent me a messenger thing and said, what do you think to this? And he, and he was like, rise. And he'd done it in the same font as we used to have on our club flyers. Wow. And I just like, and he got a butterfly on it. And butterfly is my spirit symbol. I see it, it followed me everywhere forever. And I'm like, I, do, I, do, I just like, I got teared up a little bit and I was just like, whoa, what the hell? And it was like, um, release internal self-limiting emotions was the thing he'd put. Now we had rise for a bit, but then it, didn't quite fill so we ended up being rise and shine but it's funny how he came up with that exact thing meant to be because <laughs> that that was pivotal going to rise and working at rise was pivotal you know it's like so yeah uh sorry what was the question uh community yeah. <laughs> so software engineer and designer and stuff and i build systems so it's been a dream of mine since before Facebook to build an online community. I was planning on building this software that ended up having Facebook had a lot of the features of, but I never got around to it. So we decided a year ago, let's do it. So I've actually built as an independent social media platform that looks very much and works very much like Facebook. Um, but with a difference, it's going to be very, uh, journey based so people who are going through journeys of finding themselves self-development enlightenment whatever you want to call it it's going to be a space where we can all come together and journey together and it's incorporating our tools uh so our own tools are the feeling code so that's all the emotional processing stuff some mindset stuff in there as well uh, and then we use human design and the gene keys so our kind of way of looking at human design is human design is like describing your vehicle. So it's like decide, describing this vehicle that you came to the earth on and how to drive it. And where it's really powerful is it's like giving you permission to be more of you. You know, so like, like, for instance, we've got two cars. One's manual, one's automatic. I don't get into my wife's car and go, stupid car where's the gear stick oh my god this car's useless uh, because it's different to mine i just get in it and let it change gear because it's automatic and i just accept that and this the, what i love about human design is it gives us that level of acceptance with ourselves because we're all different some of us are manual some of us are automatic some of us are this some of us are that and it 
teach you to all those parts of you and why they're like they are. Like, for instance, I had a really hard time growing up about the fact that I changed my mind all the time and never focus on one thing and want to try every single thing in the world. Well, I'm a line one three, which is the experimenter in like, that's what I'm here to do. So that's kind of all of that um, judgment and stuff like that I've got growing up over that now disappears because that's who I am. That's what I'm here to do. That's what I'm meant to do. So it's a great tool for that, you know, and, and within that, within that, um, there's like your design and your personality. So that's like the driver of the car and the backseat passenger. So the design, your design is who you truly are inside. That should be driving the car. But the trouble is, our personality, which is the conditioned one, thinks it's the driver and wants to shove the other one out of the way and drive the car. And that usually doesn't go well. <laughs> you know, so these are deconditioning tools. It allows us it allows to get right inside who you are and take out the bits that are not you. Because we're not here to teach anybody anything. You know who you are. You, you're fully equipped to be the most beautiful version of you you are. It's just we've got a lot of stuff in the way. So all of our tools are not about teaching. They're about chipping away what's not you, mm. which just allows you to come out. Mm. You know, and that's why what we're doing is called Be Who You Really Are. It's like, that's what we want for people is to be. And I always love that analogy of like um, Michelangelo when he carved David. You know, so he carved this, I don't know if any of you haven't seen it, but it's this giant statue and it's beautiful. It's amazing. So the Pope, this might be anecdotal, but anyway, it's a good story. So the Pope apparently asked him on one way opening, how did you, how on earth do you carve something that beautiful? And he went, oh, it's simple. I just chipped away everything that wasn't David. Wow. <laughs> and that's the kind of premise we come from with our stuff. You know, and then the Gene Keys is like a map that shows you how to live out that personality you have inside of the human design. You know, so then we've got a full range of tools for deconditioning. And that's what we're really about is deconditioning. Taking away all that programming we get, all the social programming or the domestication that you get from your family and friends and people around you and everything. You know, all the stuff we make not us so we fit in, all of that stuff. These tools allow you to take all that away. And the community is going to be a place where there's people doing that work doing it together because it's much more fun together it's much more supportive together we're much more similar than we're led to believe than we are so it's really good to be going through it with other people especially when you find kindred spirits and then they can tell you how they got through a certain thing and blah 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 it's just a much more fun you know so that's been through testing in the last couple of months we've got really good feedback and People have helped us to adjust things that weren't working quite right and make it even more powerful for them. And Amazing. As me building a lot of it, obviously I understand this stuff, so I filled a lot of gaps in and missed bits. So they've helped me fill the gaps in and stuff. And so we're ready to open the doors in a couple of weeks, I think. Yay. Well, I look so that's going to be super exciting. I've, I've gotten a little sneak peek and it looks really good. And I really believe in the power of community for healing. There's something really amazing that happens when we come together. We met in a community that, you know, helped us yep. both to up level in a lot of different ways. And it's interesting because we're very similar, you and I, in, in you know, our journeys and also our purpose mm. of creating community, right? Like first yeah, online yeah. and then perhaps eventually in person, you know, like there's so much that can happen from taking those next step forward, but we are gatherers. We are like the, the light bearers. And also we have a gift of connecting with others and, and bringing others together, you know, for, for healing. So it's, I love it. And you really do empower us to find our own answers. And I feel like that is the true work of a healer, right? A humble healer and mm. a leader mm. doesn't give you all the answers, but he's there to help you to uncover them within yourself and feel strong and capable um, to, and inspire to love ourselves really at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. It's like that self-love will guide us through, will help us to make those right decisions. And it's yeah. not a perfect straight line. I think you're a perfect example of that. <laughs> no. Like you've taken many years to get to where you are. This is a lifelong journey. We always have work to do. And we're not painting a picture yeah. of like, you know, snap your fingers and get better. Like, this is like everyday work. 
and you know never giving up i think that's the the one of the biggest message too is you're sending a message of hope and like never give up no matter how hard it gets always always Absolutely. always try and now we have support so if anybody needs to reach out to you in, in private um you're welcome to reach out to, to you he, you do you offer private coaching and then the community so definitely um, don't be shy. And we are together in the Kings and Queens of Raw community as well. So that's an amazing platform. You're going to be coming on and sharing once again in a few weeks. Let me give the exact date. That'll be on the 21st of May. You're coming back on to talk about self-love. So if uh, you're interested in joining us again, come back on and see Tim live in there. And I hope to be you know, able to do this again with you soon. Uh, this will be also shared on Definitely. YouTube. So thank you. We had a we had quite a few, you know, friends and family join us live on the Facebook. So that was pretty awesome to be interactive. Um, cool. And is there anything else that you would like to share today um, for our viewers? I don't think so. I think I think that's covered. But I would urge you to come on the next the live about self love because I'm not just talking about it. I'm going to give you some really good practical tips on how to foster that within yourself mm -hmm. and um it's not quite as simple as it looks you know there's a lot of stuff about looking in mirrors and telling yourself you love yourself and stuff it's way deeper than that but i give some really what i teach clients to do i'm going to teach on the on the workshop and it's just really practical easy stuff to do the because it's about relationship it's about relationship and no one teaches us how to have a relationship with us. Mm. In fact, most of us don't even realize that that's the thing. You know, so it's not so much about self-love. It's about relationship and about acceptance. Great. You know, so I just highly recommend come along for that. Yay. It's, um, I'm so looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> me too yeah because we ask ourselves like what does it mean to love ourselves and and there could be moments where like i think i'm loving myself but like you said it, it goes so much deeper and i'm really looking forward to getting some more tools because you know i still get triggered i still struggle with you know body image and self-confidence and all these things so i'm always looking for ways that i can love and honor myself i still have the guilt too of like okay oh i'm gonna go get a massage oh, who am I to spend money on a massage? And oh no, like there's something uh, better I could yeah. do. So like I'm definitely in learning to self-care, especially as a parent. Like, you know, everything else is so much more important. And it's mm. it's not always obvious. Like, what does it mean to love ourselves? So yeah, yeah. Well, I've got a I've got a great analogy called the bank of self. Mm -hmm. And once you understand the bank of self, it's dead easy. Okay. So I'll just say that it, it works. It works like a bank account. Okay. And you'll be sharing so we'll that with talk us on the 21st? Yeah, we're going to be talking deposits, Yay. withdrawals, investments. Oh. <laughs> and stuff like that. Great. I think I'm interested in banking for the first time ever. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But it works very similar to a bank account. And once you understand that and understand when you're putting money in and taking it out, it becomes really simple. Awesome. <laughs> because when you go to do something, just as a sneak preview, when you go to do something like a massage, you go and check your balance. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're in the red, you're like, mm. <laughs> and remember, everything's energy. Mm. So with you saying, I feel guilty, guilt is just an energy. Right, and guilt is the second lowest vibration. The only one lowest, shame. Right, <laughs> so that one too quite you, a bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We all do. We all do. And you go and the thing is, what does shame make you want to do? Just you don't want everyone else to look at the world, do you? You know, and it's then you're trying to get do something good for yourself inside of that. You know, it's like, but again when you check in with the balance it's in a certain place vibrationally so that tells you exactly where it is which is a gift mm. because then you get to go and work on that yeah yeah i think awareness is the first step and being honest with ourselves for where we're at like 
you know, I'm an open yeah. book. I'm not uh, here pretending to have it all figured out or to be in self-love all the time. I definitely aspire to be there. And I, I realize that, you know, I have stuff to work on. So being aware of it, being aware, like, oh, what is this? Is this shame? Is this guilt? Is this, and how can I work mm -hmm. through that? But I think I've been unconscious for so many years, numbing and hiding from those feelings mm -hmm. that, you know, being in sobriety, like, these emotions come up and you're like, oh, what is this? And it's uncomfortable. And, you know, we have mm. to, I get to work on them so that I can be on those higher frequencies more often. And they could take up more space than being in those lower, lower vibing frequencies. Yeah. Yeah. And to be totally transparent, uh, last three days, I felt really flat mm -hmm. and uh, not particularly emotional, but just a bit flat and not, it's not, it's unlike me to be not excited about doing things. It's, and then this morning I, I got up and I thought, right, start the day off well, we'll go for a walk. So I went for a walk out into the country. I'm lucky that I live in the middle of nowhere. It's beautiful. So the sun was out. So I went for a walk and I walked around this field and the farmers around here are amazing. And they, they're really good farmers. They rotate all the crops and all that kind of stuff. And they change the pathways and everything. So it's quite interesting. And anyway, I was walking around this field and I looked, I, I, I took a picture of myself and I looked in the picture and the field's really nicely ploughed and it just attracted my eye. And then I turned around and looked at it and I thought, ah, that's where I am. I'm freshly ploughed. All the seeds have been planted. They've been watered. They've been fertilised. They've had manure put on them. They've, well, they've had enough shit anyway. So, And then, and now... They're just having a bit of a break before they start sprouting. Mm. And I thought, that's where I am. Mm -hmm. So it's okay to feel a bit flat. Yeah. I've worked solid for a year. Yeah. I'm a bit tired. Yeah. You know, and I don't want to sit in front of a computer all the time, and I have been doing. And I thought, no, it's time now to just accept that that's where I am, and we're about to sprout and then grow fast. Yeah. So I was like, Okay, cool. Mm. You know, so I, I'm not up all the time by any stretch of the imagination. Oh. oh, there we go. Okay, you're back. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. It lasts minutes, not days, weeks, whatever. Because I can either process it or just accept it and feel it and whatever. So it's not about being perfect. Mm -hmm. You know, we're far from perfect as well. We're just doing the best we can in every moment. And that's all of, any of us can do. And we all go through seasons, right? There's seasons where we feel more up. There's seasons where we feel more down, but like yeah. accepting that that's where we're at and allowing ourselves to feel that. And some days we might be at 90%. Some days we might be at 20%, but yeah, yeah. we still show up Yes. for like, a hundred percent of that 20%, you know, even if it is doing <laughs> yeah. one thing, but doing it, you know, wholeheartedly, um, and, and resting a lot. We need a lot of rest, especially right now with all the energies going on, we're, we're all like literally upgrading our DNA, even energetically mm. on this planet, we're all upgrading a lot. Everybody's wow. reporting to be a little bit more tired, a little bit more sensitive. So it's normal. And it's important to like take care of our body too, like stay hydrated, drink a lot of water, fruit, juices, make some smoothies. Juice. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I know alkalize the body, I think helps too with the mental. So I always encourage you know to just eat more fruit eat more greens more raw foods and get some exercise some sunlight so that we can yeah, yeah. help to process those emotions as well we have to help ourselves you know we have to help ourselves get out of those like it's okay to accept it but like we don't want to stay there too long too and um kind of you know wallow in the depression like i could get caught up in those moments too like i don't know i think it's a it's a balance like yes we want to acknowledge and accept and also help to like keep ourselves stimulated on some level to the to the to the amount that we can you know not push ourselves too hard but yeah yeah um, yeah totally agree totally agree yeah cool. well 
thank you so much for coming on today this was really beautiful like you know seeing us both break out of our fears breaking out of our traumas and self-limiting beliefs is, is really incredible i'm so honored that you came on after a year almost off right the social media and you came out back yeah. with a bang and kings and queens of raw and now you're you know opening up to sharing with me here i'm so so honored that you would uh say yes to my invitation i'm really really happy you're welcome. to have you here yes. you're welcome thank you for asking me of course of I'm course really enjoyed it pretty enjoyed ask it. You, i will ask you again <laughs> Cool. <laughs> anytime on the 21st in kings and queens and hopefully for some more sessions as well if you'd like to reach out to tim neil do you have a website that you would like to share or not yet like i said stay tuned right before the community well yes yeah, thank you to the community i'll uh, give you the details to share once okay if anyone wants to ask me anything or wants a discovery session see what we do or whatever then just hit me up on here just friend me and say hi <laughs> sounds good perfect well thank you so much thank I love you. you and i love, love you all you that are watching today thank you for joining us and we will see you very soon okay, okay. take care bye, bye. Oh. Oh. <laughs> yes the flower <laughs> that's adorable <laughs> thank you bye